Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode. I have something pretty unique today. I have a fellow Gamecock who actually went to the University of South Carolina about the same time I did. We never overlapped, so this is kind of cool for me. I mean, we overlapped in years, but we never really met and just told different departments and, you know, all that stuff. So this is kind of cool. But Scott Wingo is the CEO of Spiffy, who has this amazing background, multiple exits, multiple companies. But what I think will be a lot of fun is like going into his early background, because many of you don't know what it was like in the early 90s when tech was just this kind of glimmer. And yet Scott kind of hit the ground running. I mean, he's had all these other big exits and Spiffy's is really cool app and everything. And he's been so involved, but I think it would be cool just to touch a little bit on what took you from sort of computer engineering into the early days of tech in the 90s. And um, then let's kind of go and talk about it. But first, Scott, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thanks, AJ. Appreciate you having me. And um, today the kids, they they do this, which is spurs up. So go Gamecocks. That's a little hand signal. It's kind of like, used to be surfs up, but now it spurs up. So. Yes. <laughs> and it's better than like, I guess you and I were there when there was the whole big debate of some of the slogans you could use or not use in South Carolina. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Or, we'll, we'll keep this PG 13. Yeah. <laughs> one of my favorite jokes when I give uh, talks about entrepreneurship is no one really knows much about the Gamecocks. Uh, so, you know, if I'm out West or up North or something, so I'll always say, people ask me, what is a Gamecock? And I'll say, it's a, I'll tell you the PG version. It's a butt kicking chicken. So I always get some chuckles out, out of that. Well, and then, uh, the other thing that uh, we share is, uh, I don't know if you went to any Hootie and the Blowfish concerts, but they're, uh, that's one of the fun things about that era when we went to school was going to see them. And they were just one of 10 bands we'd go see. And now they're, they're super famous. Scott, the guitarist, was the guy who taught me how to be a radio DJ. Yeah. So yeah, I, Hootie was a regular. And it was so cool because they worked. And it's going to be sad. Even though I was never really that sound music fan at the time, they were at every show, every open concert. They toured. I mean, those were guys, were guys who worked. They earned it. I mean, Hootie is that must defend the right, the honor of Hootie. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm from uh, Aiken, South Carolina. Uh, oh, I don't know, cool. Uh, if you're from South Carolina as well, but yeah, a little town and you know, it's near Augusta, Georgia, is kind of its only claim to fame. Yeah, I know that area, the border. No, I actually went down because I ran fast and sort of caught a ball, but before I even got there, I got injured, <laughs> so I never, even, <laughs> I never even played or did anything. But yeah, I went to South Carolina from New York. But yeah, it was great four years. I mean, it took me a couple of years to uh, enjoy sweet tea. But once that happened, then I, I felt you. like, okay, I think I can live here. Sweet tea is that <laughs> kind of, yeah, you have to do it. But like, how did you get into, because for me, it was such a small world about the understanding of technology and what was happening back at that point, you know, remembering sort of my experience. How did you cut from, I guess, computer engineering was a little bit more advanced, you know, a little bit more forward into that area, obviously, than my chemistry and international relations. But how did you kind of decide to go to computer engineering and then build your own company around building technology tools. What was that kind of process for you? Yeah. So it turns out, you know, my childhood was, was pretty vanilla. I was kind of like upper, lower income, if you will. So just like not quite middle income. But the one thing that was unique uh, about where I grew up in Aiken is uh, it's a really weird town. So half the kids are kind of poor local kids. And then the other half are the children of nuclear yeah. uh, PhDs, uh, physicists. Um, and that's because we have the Savannah River site is the largest employer in Aiken. And that used to be an active nuclear breeder for uranium that went into nuclear bombs. In Aiken, we call it the bomb plant. It's the technical name. <laughs> and uh, so it was it was really weird growing up in that environment because my high school was very bifurcated. You were either the kid of a, a PhD and you were doing you know what would now be called calculus BC, like when you were yep. you know, 15, uh, or you were in remedial math. And I was pretty good on the math side, but not as good as those other kids. Uh, and our science fairs were crazy. It was like volcanoes. So I would do like the volcano with, with vinegar and Geiger counters. We had a kid in my high school that he built a, a little self-controlled autonomous vehicle that could shoot a Nerf rocket and hit a target. You could place it anywhere in the room and it would drive to it and shoot a missile. And this is like <laughs> 1984. I have no idea. 
to this day, like how that was even possible. The other thing that was unique about my upbringing was my dad is an entrepreneur. And yeah. at the time we didn't even know what that word was. And we, it was kind of embarrassing because I was the only one that was kind of in the advanced math stuff whose dad didn't work at the bomb plant. And we would just kind of say he was, he was self-employed. Uh, we didn't really know what to call entrepreneurship, but he was a programmer and uh, this is all COBOL. So he actually oh, yeah. went to University of South Carolina as well. Yeah. So this is old school. He has all these jokes like uh, COBOL begins with C. That's kind of like a fun COBOL joke, I guess. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I put some code down on COBOL. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he can tell stories about the the cards and all, but in my house, so he, he, his entrepreneurial endeavor was he did consulting and implemented computer systems. And then ultimately he started a company to do carpet systems. So he would go to carpet retailers and he had an inventory and a point of sale system. And it was all based on a mainframe called a digital electronics corporation, PDP 11. You probably know what that is, but today people may not know what it is. So in my house, you know, I had this little tiny 2000 square house. A quarter of it was full of a mainframe computer. So he had his office in our house. You had a home computer. And, you know, my friends, would, uh, we had a home computer. Yeah. And, you know, literally in the seventies, I had a home computer. So I was the only person that had a computer and, you know, my dad would let me play on it. So I played adventure games and Star Trek games. So, you know, from age of eight on, uh, and I could connect to, we had a modem so I could, you know, a 300 baud modem. So I could do that. So by the time I got to college, and you probably can't tell, but I'm also not super athletic. So I didn't really have a, a team to join or anything like that. So I started the computer club at my high school mm -hmm. and was always just really into computers. So it kind of came naturally to me and I always had a little bit of an edge because I grew up with a computer around me. Yeah. And, you know, lo and behold, that ended up being in today's world, quite a bit of a foresight to, to have you know had that exposure uh, early on. So by the time I got to South Carolina, I really thought I wanted to do, I wanted to be different than my dad and he was software and I thought I would do hardware. I was really fascinated by how underlying computers work. Then I realized I'm not really good at that. Like a, there's a permanence to hardware I don't like that if you make a mistake, I make lots of mistakes. Yeah. <laughs> so so you make a mistake with hardware, it's kind of like it's hard to fix. With software, you just kind of, you can fix it very easily. So I, I naturally gravitated after my first year of kind of general engineering, I gravitated more to the software side of computer engineering. That's how I got into it. But by the time I was at South Carolina, you know, I was pretty adept at the internet and the Usenet mm. boards and yeah, you know, Unix and, and that kind of stuff. And Tell me. so, yeah. so yeah, so, so I've been a, a geek for, for quite a long time. Wow. I mean, you were probably much more advanced, but yeah, I remember those days where it was just like trying to get into, you know, the Telma into things. I had um, index cards with Unix commands that I used to just carry around whenever I could get access to, to the machines. But yeah, I had a trash 80, but TRS 80 back in the day, nowhere near as close as to what you had. But yeah, that Star Trek game yeah. with the K for the Klingon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it was good. Hours. Yeah, it was move based and it would tell you what happened in your move. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I got hours in that game with the tape. I had a tape drive for it, but uh, all right. So. The, the other thing that what uh, that you'll find interesting is uh, you probably had this too. Let's see if you had this experience. By the time I was, I could drive 15 or 16, I fell in love with Lamborghinis. Um, so I had that classic Alpine Lamborghini poster mm -hmm. in my room. Did you have that one? Yeah, it's red. I know which one. I know Actually, the one. Yeah, out. I know I had, the one. I had to go buy an Alpine. I've spent like $200 of my lawn mowing money on to get an Alpine radio so I could get the free poster. <laughs> so uh, when I was 17, I was like, I want a Lamborghini. And then my dad, in a fit of frustration, because I always, I liked computers, but I just wanted to play games. And he kept saying I should learn programming. And I pushed back against that pretty hard. So then he's, he cleverly took a different approach one day and he slid a magazine over to me one day. We talk a lot about Lamborghinis and how I was going to get one. And uh, he was trying to explain to me how expensive they are. And then he gave me a magazine and it was Fortune magazine on the cover was Bill Gates. And the headline was how Bill Gates made $100 million from a, his big deal with Microsoft. Well, that was the IPO. They didn't even really call it IPOs back then. Yeah. So then I realized I read that magazine and I was like, all right, I found someone geekier than I am. So that's good news about Bill Gates. You can always, you know, no, no matter how geeky and nerdy you feel like you are, Bill <laughs> Gates can always kind of 10X you there. Yeah. So I was like, all right, that's good. Uh, and then I figured, all right, Lamborghini, I need to do uh, an IPO and then that'll make me a million dollars and then I can get a Lamborghini. So that when I was 17, I set those goals uh, for myself. So I wanted to be a millionaire by the time. Oh, and Bill Gates was uh, 30 years old when they did the IPO. So I was like, well, I'll do that by the time I'm 30. Unusual set of goals for a, a 17 year old but i was yeah. pretty uh, i was pretty locked in on it 
No, those I are great. Talk goals, about it too much because I wasn't sure I could pull it off. But yeah, my dad and I would talk about it a lot. Actually, that's pretty cool because I think my goals were more like getting a girlfriend. <laughs> I don't think I had much beyond that. That was in the the Lamborghini was the Lamborghini get, would yeah. get me girls was kind of how I thought about yeah I thought that's how I thought the world worked but apparently it doesn't. Yeah, but the order that helped you, you know, where I think mine I didn't have the correct order. I found the, the other big influence on me that made me really stretch is seeing Star Wars. So Star Wars has been a huge influence on my life. I saw it when I was nine, and just this idea of I felt. I felt a lot of empathy and, and uh, simpatico with Luke Skywalker because he was like stuck in this boring, you know, I was from this little place in nowhere, Aiken. I felt like I was stuck there. And the fact he could kind of go from that to being this, you know, his hero's journey. I think it, it kind of enabled me to stretch a little bit more than maybe other other folks would have thought about at the time. So that was a huge influence on me. Today, I'm still, so you can't see in this shot, but I've got a lot of Star Wars stuff surrounding me here. I once a took big a big Star Wars collector in the mid 94, 90, 95, late 95. I took a job um, with an agency purely because I would have been the project manager for Hasbro's toy. They had just gotten the rights for the uh, Star Wars toys. So we were categorizing nice. all the Star Wars toys and I was the one who was in control of 200 toys and I could distribute them to the developers who did my bidding. That was a good year. But all right, so you go off, you have this concept, you know, you have your BHAG to get rich, get the car, get the girl. And I know in high, you know, to anyone listening now, it kind of said, well, of course, entrepreneurism, you know, da, 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 there's courses, there's programs. I remember once asking in a business class, like, oh, so how do I become an entrepreneur? And the professor, like, why would you want to do that? Yeah, you know, your father had done the program, but maybe just kind of from that program, getting your master's to then that first company, just yeah, you know, maybe walk through that kind yeah. of thought pro and what yeah, you know, what had happened there. Just because that's I'm finding it very fascinating. Yeah. So in engineering, we also at that point in time didn't have much talk about entrepreneurship. We did have uh, I did have one professor though, and he was really into it, and his name was Dr. Pettis. And he he would start every class and say, Are you a are you a mercenary or a missionary? Um, and, you know, and then he had a whole talk track about that and he had like a cheesy slide. This is when they had overheads, you know, this is not a digital yep. projector. So he would like have a, you know, a mercenary who was like some guy carrying a gun and then a missionary who was like going on a church mission or something, you know, it got you thinking like, what do you want to be? And then if you went and asked him, he would always kind of give you stuff. So a couple, by the time I was a junior, a couple of friends and I said, well, let's go ask Dr. Pettis if we could just have an office. And he said, I don't have an office, but there's like a closet over there. If you guys want to throw some computers in there, you can use it because we were going to work on a project for him or something. So then suddenly we had an office and we were like living like grad students and we would like basically live in that room for because we were working on some fun project at the time. And then when it came time to graduate, he connected us with some guys at NC State that were also entrepreneurial, a guy named Tom Miller. And we went and pitched myself and two friends. We actually went up to Raleigh from columbia quite an adventure and pitch them on we would come as a group and work on their project and we could just you know and we we demonstrated some stuff we've been working on and that worked they gave us uh, kind of in-state tuition and a stipend to entice us to come but then they were quite entrepreneurial and talked about it a lot and then they later formalized a program and i've i've sponsored a lot of stuff there where now they have entrepreneurship for engineers and a whole initiative around it but at the time it was kind of like a underground, you know, set of people that kind of knew kids that were interested in, they would kind of funnel us, uh, you know, in hindsight, we kind of got into that system just by leaning into it a little bit and, and being missionaries versus mercenaries. And it worked out great for us. Uh, and then, so I did 18 months here at NC State, and then I got some job offers, IBM, Motorola, which would be the big company thing. Yeah. And I thought I wanted to work for a big company and try it out because, you know, I saw the downside of entrepreneurship. My dad would work, he would literally work 140 hours. You know, he'd like literally just sleep four hours a night and just like grind it out. So we didn't see him a lot for, you know, like months on time. And he would like have to go fly to visit customers that had problems like, you know, on a moment's notice. So I, so I knew there was a, a, you know, an edge to entrepreneurship. And then I went on an interview to IBM and Motorola and it was just like depressing because they basically were like, you know, if you work really hard for 30 years, you go from MTS one to MTS 20 and, you know, you could be an architect and it's like this whole thing. And like, 
everyone else bought into it. And that's kind of like, that's a depressing pitch for me. Like I'm just going to have to like grind it out here for 30 years. And, and you know, what's the point? So I went to work for the startup and it was a, a guy I'd worked with previously at an internship. We were at NCR together. I did an internship in okay, Columbia cool. at NCR. Yeah. A, yeah. So uh, it was up in Connecticut. So uh, at a startup, he started called Bristol technology and they hired me to be an engineer. But what I realized is I'd never in school, I'd never had an opportunity to take a single business class or anything. I realized I really liked the business stuff. And I liked talking to customers, which is an engineer, you know, we're almost kind of like trained to stay in your cubicle and, and don't ask questions. Yep. <laughs> and, uh, you know, which, uh, you know, I'm an introvert, so that, that is my natural uh, uh, place to be. But but I like to stretch myself and, and try to do new things. So then uh, I realized I really like startups. And, and then a couple of my friends uh, wanted to start a company. So after about three years of that, moved back here and started my first company in 1995. So that was my path to kind of pull in the trigger. The biggest pull is I wanted to really get back to this triangle area. I really liked it here. It was kind of the, the things I liked about South Carolina, the Southern living and the, the little bit of a you know nicer people and slower lifestyle but with a little like 10 percent more high-tech kind of vibe um, so it's just perfect for me i've been to silicon valley a lot and that's just too much that's like all they talk about and so so you can't ever unplug so i really liked the research triangle area and wanted to get back here after doing grad school here yeah it is a beautiful area it is definitely one of the areas i've i've liked the most as i've looked at different places around there well you did that and then after that success, you've had quite a bit more on this. Now you have your fourth company, Spiffy. Where do you see yourself as an entrepreneur these days? You're on the board of companies, you have your own fund, you have you know another company. So where are you? as an entrepreneur. Yeah. So, so the way I think about it is I've tried to do something bigger and bigger every time. So my first company was called Stingray Software, 1995 to 1998. Bootstrapped that. I tried raising venture capital, failed miserably. Yeah. I was literally an engineering person that had worked for a company for three years and had no business experience. The thing that got me through was some mentors. So some folks I'd met at NC State, there were a generation of entrepreneurship ahead, uh, a guy, Richard Holcomb and Chris Evans. They were great mentors for me. And it got to the point where I was using a ridiculous amount of their time and I felt bad about it. And I tried to pay them and they refused and basically said, you know, in our community, we, we pay it forward. So, you know, we appreciate you trying to pay us, but what we want you to do is help that next generation of entrepreneurs when it's time. I said, okay. So we sold that first company to a public company for about $12 million. Um, so that was a really good outcome with yeah. no VC. And then at the time, you know, I'm a Star Wars fan. Uh, at a time, this, the internet was being born. And Mark Andreessen had put out the, the browser and all that good stuff. And I was like, I took to that like a duck to water, as you can imagine. So what happened is at the birth of e-commerce, there was more auction sites than there were fixed price sites. Um, yep, and I remember. So being a Star Wars fan, I could go from, you know, I would buy stuff and I had this deadly combination. I just sold a business. So I had a lot of, oh, and I, I we actually sold that um, about uh, three months before my 30th birthday. So I actually got to achieve one of my, my, uh, my BHAGs there. Yeah. Uh, but then I had two kids, so I bought a minivan. So <laughs> the sad, sad part of the story is there's, spoiler, there's no Lamborghini coming into the story. So, so I have not achieved that one yet and probably won't. So what I did is I realized there was a need to search these auction sites and have an agent go buy stuff for you. So yeah. started a company called Auction Rover. And okay. it was a auction search engine and bid, bidding tools company. And then we also had seller tools. The idea was we would do paid search for auction sites. And then we got acquired in six months by the company that had invented paid search called goto.com, who yeah. changed their name to Overture. So that was a good exit. And then the dot-com bubble burst literally three months after we got acquired, which was good because we rode that out. Then what happened is in 2001, we realized that after the dot-com bubble burst, there was all this excess inventory out in the world. And in our seller tools, we're still alive. And we got rid of the search engine because eBay was the only auction site left after the dot-com bubble burst. So then our seller tools started to be used by Nokia, Motorola, and IBM to sell excess inventory on eBay. And we only charged twenty dollars a month for these tools. So, you know, literally, IBM sold two million dollars worth of ThinkPad laptops and paid us twenty dollars. And I'm uh, I don't have an MBA, but I was thinking, you know, I think we could charge more for this. So we went to those customers, and they were really struggling with the software because it was built for an eBay power seller who lists. They don't have 
everything they list is unique, not kind of evergreen. Yeah. Um, so we redid the product for, I kind of say we Henry Fordized it. So if you had a million SKUs, you could sell them in five minutes. And then that got off to the races. We took that idea and spun it out in 2001 and called it Channel Advisor. So long story short, uh, I've gotten really good at raising venture capital now. So we raised 90 million of venture capital. It was one of the early B2B software as a service companies. And we went public in 2013. So I got to uh, check that off the box. Uh, it took a lot longer than I thought I would. I thought I could do it by the time I was 30. I ended up being 40 when I did that. But that was you know, definitely one of my entrepreneurial highlights to ring the bell and meet Jim Cramer and all the CNBC. I'm a CNBC junkie, so it's kind of like surreal to be on the other side of all that. And then around 2003, during Channel Advisor, I bought a car wash as a diversification thing and then built another one in 05. I've always loved cars and car washes, as you can, well, you know about cars, but, but car washes are always kind of been interesting to me. So then right around the time of the Channel Advisor IPO, I had my first Uber app experience. And as an e-commerce person, the way that hit me was I suddenly connected these dots and I said, we've seen products go digital in the form of e-commerce. And that's 5 trillion of GDP as consumer goods got turned digitalized. Consumer services are twice as big. So, so on an average basis, if you think about your house and your life, you actually consume twice as many services as goods. Most people, it's even more. We just don't need that much stuff at the end of the day. But we like, you know, restaurants and travel and all the other house services and car services and all that stuff. So, so I was thinking, all right, this is something that's twice the size of e-commerce. It's going to go digital faster than e-commerce because e-commerce laid all the groundwork. How can I participate in this big economic, this kind of wave of innovation? And I felt like as an e-commerce entrepreneur, I had an edge. What Channel Advisor does is help brands and retailers sell on eBay and Amazon and other marketplaces. So I've been in e-commerce for 20 years. And I've also kind of uh, jealous, you know, been, been watching with fascination uh, Amazon get built from you know, an online bookstore to a multi-trillion dollar behemoth and uh, learned a lot from watching them that, that, you know, how they, they chewed away at that. So I wanted to get in, do something more active and big there. Uh, and the idea that I settled on was 50. So, so taking the car wash and putting it in an app and making it mobile and basically saying, could we put a dent in the car care world? Um, if you ask anybody, the other thing I like about the car care world is no one wakes up and says, I had a great car care experience. Um, if you've had a Lexus or something like that, maybe you've had okay car experiences. But even then, and even in this post-COVID world, I think we've all seen a degradation of customer service. So that creates an opportunity for us at Spiffy to have a 10 times better experience. So at Spiffy, what we do is um, our technicians are our employees because we want to really have a premium offering controlled experience. We come to you. So we're totally mobile. We can do oil change, car wash and tires. Yeah. So started that in 2014 as my fourth company. And, and then this is a really long answer, but, and then on the side, what I've done is when I do have free time, so, so family first and then my company. And then if I have some free time, I like to give back. So in 2015, here in the Triangle area, we had so many startups, I put a list out called the tweener list, which was a list of our startups from a million to 80 million, so that as an ecosystem, we could focus on those and help them go faster yeah. and grow and get to IPO or exit. Then I, I opened up a little fund around that um, here recently, because it turns out, I, I believe that's a really interesting group of companies because once they get to a million, um, the failure rate goes way down. Yes. Uh, and then, you know, we, we really love to support the entrepreneurs in this area. So I thought, you know, this is a way to potentially make money and support entrepreneurs, talk to a bunch of other serial entrepreneurs in the area. And we got together and uh, it's a year old now and we invested over 3 million in about 50 companies. So we write really small checks. The idea is to build an index of these triangle companies and help support the entrepreneurs as a, as a network, if you will. Put some formality around it. It's always been here and informal, but put a little bit more of a formality around it. Put some dollars into the companies so that we all have a stake. As an entrepreneur, you know, Spiffy in my mind is my last company um, and we're, I'll take it as long. It, it has such a big TAM, you know, I, I could be at this another 20, 30 years. So, so I'm not leaving anytime soon. But then, you know, at the end of Spiffy's run, I really want to then probably focus on just helping other entrepreneurs and, and take a lot of the, the scar tissue I've developed over the years and, and try to help people avoid, you know, scale their businesses, avoid the pitfalls and that kind of thing. Just from the experiences you have, you probably have much, much more scar tissue than I have. But I find it funny that somehow over the years, it's the scar tissue that has more value. I find a lot of times when I talk with younger entrepreneurs, it's like not the cool things you learn or the cool tricks. It's, oh, how you survive basically getting that knife in the ribs or, you know. <laughs> yeah, here's a topical one. And um, 
in 2008, Channel Advisor had just raised $20 million in a Series C. And, you know, the great financial crisis hit. Yep. And the first thing we did was spread that money across, you know, literally like 30 bank accounts to, to get the FDIC limits. So, uh, you know, there's there's a piece of information that's very topical today. So so last Thursday, when the poop started hitting the fan on Silicon Valley Bank, I was able to make some quick calls and hopefully you know, help some people. Now we know that we, we avoided, they, they didn't have to, but at the time it wasn't clear. So that's the kind of stuff that you think it's a once in a lifetime black swan event, but here we are again. So, yeah. I mean, and just, you know, from to the, I remember leading up to that because I had an agency and we were, we were doing quite well. We were getting pitched all these crazy safe as cash things that then soon locked up for 12 plus months. Yeah, the, the money market accounts that yeah. were pure liquid in, but but had 6% interest or something. And you're like, yeah. oh, that sounds too good to be true. Spoiler alert, it was. Yeah, yeah. I, I got lucky because I was like, oh, I had two banks offering me. Let me think about it. And then it just locked up. So yeah, it was more my divering that I got lucky than anything back in those days. But yeah, it was, an, you know, this last weekend was one of the more interesting weekends because much smaller, but I'm on... I'm an LP in a couple of small angel funds and a couple advisor to a few startups. And it was really like, oh, our payroll, we don't have money with them. Oh, we're good. Yeah, you know, literally getting those emails Friday and then Friday evening, like our payroll just bound or our payroll didn't go out because XYZ payroll processor uses. It was kind of a rippling. Yeah, I wasn't going to say that line, but yeah, <laughs> rippling was. Yep, yeah, I know it well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think a bunch of people were like, wait, what? The knock-ons are going to be very interesting. I, yes, that is a really fascinating because in that kind of growth of where you are now, I find Spiffy really interesting because I've started becoming involved and only at this point acquired some smaller productized services, content sites, and stuff that I've been looking. But one of the constant things in the acquisition entrepreneurship space is yeah, you know, the talk around car washes and stuff like that, and I know that's been something moving. A lot of private equity is kind of moving down to the space. People are trying to take smaller ones and move it up. And here you come with a complete, you know, basically the, it's like, oh, that's nice that you guys are going to spend all that money. Let me just disrupt that <laughs> with a direct <laughs> consumer product. <laughs> so having watched e-commerce, that's where it went, right? So, so we're basically kind of the whole theory here is e-commerce was uh, the first movie and you know, digital services is going to be the second movie. So, so in e-commerce, what happened is first, uh, all the retailers went, went digital with e-commerce and, but then the brand said, wait a minute, I'm Nike and I'm selling to you Macy's so that you can just put my shoes online and sell to the consumer in a mall. You added value because you were in front of the consumer, you know, physically walking through the mall. And you saved me all that money from having to open Nike stores. And then they started to see more people come to Nike.com than Macy's.com. So then they basically said, why do we have all these middlemen in an online environment? It's more, what happens is as things go digital, layers come out. And then the other thing that changes is consumer behavior. And you're, you're an agency person, so you probably are a fellow study of this. I, I find it fascinating to see how people change their behavior and what it takes to get them to change their behavior. But when they do, how it's sticky. There's one of my favorite reports, and you've probably seen this, is... Uh, Deloitte came out. This is pretty old now, probably 2017, I think. They, they came out with this paper. And it's, some of these things are kind of like obvious, but they put a framework around it. And they talked about the value-oriented consumer and the convenience-oriented consumer. And they mapped that to the retail landscape. And the, the interesting thing about retail is mall-based retailers are in Death Valley, but you have dollar stores and wholesale clubs are growing like three times the rate of retail. Mall stores are in decline, and then you have the online guys. And what's happening is that value-oriented consumer gravitates towards that dollar store and wholesale experience. The convenience consumer gravitates towards that Amazon, Instacart experience. And that's left no one for Macy's, JCPenney, and Sears because the mall used to be convenient, but now that it's not, it's neither convenient or value-oriented, and this bifurcation has left them without a customer base. So all that was part of my my thinking starting Spiffy. I was thinking there is no convenience-oriented play for car care. You know, the, the Jiffy Lubes and all, they say they are, but I think if you actually go and, and then there's express car washes. Yeah. If you asked them, they would think they're going after the convenience-oriented consumer, but they're really not. You know, they're kind of like, 
oh, we have a lobby with coffee and crappy Wi-Fi. And, you know, surely, you know, you and I are never going to view that as a great experience. Um, and then, you know, then once I had that first Uber experience, I was like, this is the experience we need to try to replicate. You know, I press a button on my phone and my life's taken care of. So, so how do we, rep that is convenience oriented versus, okay, I can go to an express wash and it only takes five minutes, but I wait in line an hour and have to vacuum it myself. That's the, that's the fake convenience. So, so that, that was kind of the, the insight for Spiffy was that I feel like they have this big blind spot of what is true convenience in today's modern world, yeah. because they, they, they don't come from the e-commerce world like I do. And if we can provide that, you know, customers should flock to us. And um, you'll find this interesting. Today, we spend like a very nominal amount on advertising because people just kind of find us. They, they kind of say, this should exist because in their mind, there's Uber, there's WAG, there's all these things where I press a button on my phone and I can take care of my life. You know, I can have someone go grocery shop for me. Why can't I press a button and have my car taken care of? So, so, so they just think it should exist and they find us. And then also, I don't think you've seen one of our trucks yet, but we also on our, our vans, they're big blue and they have the giant penguin logo and that generates all this it's like having you know we have like over 350 vans across the u.s right now okay cool uh, it's like paying for the best outdoor advertising possible but it's free because it's on our vans it's traveling billboards no i mean before the show i was telling scott literally last night i was having this discussion around finding a place to clean because it literally is you know some gas stations have kind of that small drive through i lived in spain for five years just moved back after I sold my last company, took that <laughs> mid, mid retirement. I don't know what, yeah, semi retirement, whatever, and lived in Southern Spain. And there was the really, yeah, the typical low end, but then they had these places you would go usually near the fancier shopping areas, almost like a VIP service. You would give the guy a key. He would, you know, at a nice little booth. They would drive it behind the building and they would give you a card and you'd come back 45 minutes an hour later and your car was perfect and they always had the fancy car collection parked right outside to kind of let you know where it was but yeah here not there so it's kind of excited when i saw your app i was like oh that's perfect yeah you're a busy dude and you know and then if you i don't know if you have two cars but you know you can get both cars done simultaneously and if you need an oil change we'll knock that out too so freeze you up you could be podcasting while your car's being taken care of i have a tesla but my wife has whatever the bw volkswagen whatever and there was an oil change indicator and just trying to get advice like where to go locally basically started one of those like flame wars on whatever the local community message board and it's like okay this is not going to help it's interesting watching how the discovery process is because it's gone from such a cool concept of how to discover local to kind of a manufactured information piece the yelps the paid search the if i did do another company i would try to put yelp out of business i, I have no love lost for those guys it's an extortion racket they're constantly wanting you to pay for advertising and so so our reviews are really bad there because they uh, suppress our positives they say they're fraudulent they're like companies don't have that many positives. And we're like, we can show you the transactions and we're not soliciting. They're like, the algorithm suppresses them. But you could be an advertiser and maybe that'll solve it. And we're like, no. <laughs> Back in the day, like they used to say, you know, and having run search agency, you know, doing a lot in the search, it was like, there was a period of time where it was like, somehow miracle, if you were spending a lot of money on paid search on the different things, you would end up with really good organic. I mean, mostly that stopped. I think there are some on the secondary engines you can see stuff, but all right, sorry, <laughs> go and geeking out. That is fascinating. And one of the things I really would, you've had these obvious transitions. I want to ask on one, but then maybe one specific one you had mentioned earlier, transition or what seemed like a transition, but then also just ask as an entrepreneur, a lot of times we go in thinking, okay, if I can rub my two sticks together fast enough, get that spark out there and, you know, start the business and it starts making money, all is good. And then all of a sudden we hit a million bucks and it's like, wait, what's happening here? I mean, yeah, it's great having money, but all of a sudden now, this stuff is harder. And then again, five, and from my experience, as I've approached 10 and not quite broken through, I've had that experience again, and then knocked back down to the five range. You talked about after the first business, getting into sort of the raising money, because you had tried earlier and didn't even, you know, and you kind of referenced, you were, you, know, you were 
nobody, you know, you were this young student, not nobody, but this young student, all of a sudden, and then all of a sudden you went with your next one after the dot bomb crash. And there was, once again, for people who weren't around, there was that period from like 2001 where all of a sudden it was like, especially after 9-11, it was like, okay, the good days are not coming back. There was like two years where everyone was like, maybe it's coming back. And then 9-11, it was like, oh, it's not coming back. And then there was yeah. like what I call the drift where people were just like, oh, please don't talk about technology into about 2005. Then all of a sudden it started coming back a bit. What was that like where you decided you were going to go out, raise money? What did you have to do to transition into that type of entrepreneur from bootstrapping to now becoming that type, you know, raising funds? Yeah, my, my mental model uh, is influenced uh, like you. I, I I imagine I read a lot of business books, right? So there's Good to Great, which is a classic, which is where I, I mentioned the BHAG that comes from that book. And another one of my favorites is Crossing the Chasm, which is kind of like how you, yes. it's a really good framework for going from one to five to 10. Um, yeah, I and read that after. Another one that had an influence. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> after <Sorry>. the fact, <laughs> <laughs> I would have told you to read it if I did. Another one I read, and this is from the guy that does Dilbert Scott Adams. He has an old book called "How to Fail at Everything and Still Win Big." And two things in that book that hit me were systems versus goals, um, like how to build a system, and then also a, this kind of concept as a, as an individual as you think about your career, this stack of skills. So I, I always use that framework. So in my first company, I was really good at engineering, right, and knew knew that. I knew nothing about any marketing or anything, but in that business, I got pretty good at understanding customers and how to talk to them. And that's been a real fundamental skill for me in building anything is kind of like a learned skill because making a customer happy is a little tricky. You have to be, there's a nuanced way of asking them questions to get to their pain. Yeah. You know, your intuition as an entrepreneur is you're trying to sell is to just talk a lot because you're kind of like to fill the space. But you're not, if you're talking, you're not listening. So, so you know, I would say in my first company, that's the skill I built a, a lot more. And I use that for solving the VC problem. So I pitched like all the local VCs here. They all told me no. And the reasons I got didn't make any sense to me, but you know, I researched them. Number one was my first business was profitable. They would say, we don't really invest in profitable businesses. Doesn't make any sense, right? But I was kind of like, well, if three VCs told me that, uh, there must be something to that. And then another one said, we won't invest in you because every investment we make has to return the whole fund, which didn't make sense to me again as an engineer. I was like, that mathematically stupid because then how come you're not returning? You make 10 investments. How come you're not returning 100x? And it's because they have so many failures. But anyway, so then having time to reflect on that over three years, you know, what was happening was our TAM was too small. So, so that's what they really meant. And he didn't do a good job articulating that to me. Yeah. So then I learned about TAM and, you know, what is TAM and why does it matter? And, you know, sure enough, my first business probably had a terminal revenue rate of 30 million and that we had to, we had like 30 or 40% market share, which you usually don't put in it, which would be highly unusual for a TAM calculation. <laughs> but for smaller TAMs, you can you can get in there. So then over time, you know, in that three years at my first company, I built that skill stack. So then when I started my next company, I also, also when I was pitching my first company, I was just talking about how, you know, our customers and how, what we were building, like I was doing an engineering, I was talking about the product. I didn't really set the vision. I didn't say, I never had a pitch that was like, there's this many engineers in the world. And if we can get them all using, I never talked like that. So my second company, I would talk and say, look, we have this idea. There's all these auction sites. E-commerce is going to be huge. And we're going to build this search engine. And then, you know, in my first meeting, they're like, can we write you a $3 million check? Like, and I was like, sure. So, so I, I got better at it. I watched a lot of other pictures. So then as I've gone, those transitions you're talking about, I've tried to add to my skill stack and, and kind of get better and better at, you know, the thing I tell other tech entrepreneurs all the time is I spend almost 85% of my time selling. And it's really, I think of it as persuading. So I have to persuade investors to invest and stay with us and add more. I have to persuade people to come work for us. I have to persuade people to stay. I have to persuade customers to come work with us. So, so I spend a lot of time persuading and that's the, the skill that I've had to work on the most over my 30 year career as a tech founder. Um, and, you know, a lot of it's come from watching other people persuade, reading books and just kind of like really trying to hone that skill over time. I had to be pretty self-aware. You know, this is the humble part of it is that I was really, really bad at it when I was in my twenties. 
Yeah. You know, I, you know being an engineer, you kind of like have a little bit of an ego thing too. And I was probably like, these guys are stupid. Why won't they invest in this? It's such a good idea. You, know, you just like, you just get frustrated because you, you don't understand why they don't see it, what you do, but that's really a failing on you, not them to, you're not persuading them and showing them what you're seeing to, to get them involved. That understanding, it's the one thing to know how to do something. It's another to understand why someone would want to be interested into something and then put it into their own. Yeah, that in a sense, I think we all need a good amount of reps at the situation. For me, I agree very much. I didn't learn to sell into my mid thirties. If anything, you know, I was in situations I thought I was selling because, you know, the late nineties, I was flying around the world and signing million dollar contracts. But the reality is my skill set was, do you want fries with that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that really was this is a good way to late, start. Well, in the late nineties, it was kind of like, if you knew anything about technology, yeah, there was that 98, 99, that was sort of like just unreal type of yeah period of time. But yeah, learning how to get there. That's really cool. And how did you find, it seems very much that like what helped you, you know, besides getting the reps was this idea of hearing other people do it. How were you hearing other people learning from that experience? Because a lot of times it's like, okay, you hear someone, but like, what was that process for you? You know, here in the Research Triangle Park area, and I know in the Virginia um, area, you guys have that NVCA, I think it's called. Yeah, um, I just moved here. I'm a New Yorker. Council. So, yeah. Okay. But <laughs> okay. Every area has kind of like an entrepreneurial startup group. Um, yeah. Ours in the triangle is called the Council for Entrepreneurial Development. So they'll do an annual pitch event where VCs come in and they see pitches. Well, one of my favorite things to do is go watch other people pitch. And, you know, I'll, I'll mentally watch that and kind of say, I like how they approach this or that didn't really land very good. And I'll kind of watch it in the persona of a VC. And I'll try to kind of like, you know, I've probably seen it at this point. 500 pitches. Another thing that's really nice is whenever someone goes public, they go on a, a roadshow and now those are published. So it's really interesting to watch people's roadshow pitches as well. That's where you're seeing, you know, the most elite pitches. So it's kind of fun to go watch the series A seed investor pitches, B and C pitches, and then kind of like the elite. Another great way to see a lot of pitches is Shark Tank. Yeah, I think that's been, they're, they're cheesy and they have a cheesiness to them, but it is interesting you know, it, it's not that far away from reality. And, you know, you can see the judges get wrapped up in the unit economics and the, the TAM and that kind of thing. So it's just a lot of watching other pitches is where I osmos a lot of my best pitch things. Yeah. And it's fun. You know, we live in this amazing age where go watch uh, every uh, Jeff Bezos talk is amazing. Steve Jobs pitches. That's you know, that's the, the tip of the, to be top there to watch like Steve Jobs when he released, you know, any of his later products later in life, just watching the pitch there is just, you know, that stylistic approach that he takes. You don't want to like totally be like the Theranos lady and copy, but you need to take little elements from that and build your own style that, you know, don't just start wearing black turtlenecks or something like that. So that, that's how I've built that skill over time is really watching a lot of pitching going on. No, I like that steel, but make it your own. Or yes, they say, yeah, my favorite artists. pitch, and this yeah. will be good. There was a Mad Men episode where Don Draper is pitching Kodak. They have this new product that is for slides. Yeah, uh, that's the best. I, I watch that probably once a month. I just love watching that segment. So if you Google Don Draper carousel Kodak pitch, that is probably the best pitch you'll you'll ever see. It's ob obviously fiction, but the, just the whole, that's the master persuader right there. Just, it, it's like a whole nother level. Everyone I know who pitches or does any sort of level of pitches has weapon. That really, I remember seeing it and just being like, oh, after all the pitches I've done in my life, I was just like, oh, yeah. And of course, yeah. Trying to do it really bad. Yeah. <laughs> the best it is it's so good that at the end, the account manager says, well, enjoy your next meeting. <laughs> that's great he, he knows that they've totally just crushed it that's always the best feeling when you know you have won all right you you're talking about moving you know growing this growing spiffy you know making it that home experience that higher end experience you know that higher quality experience you're looking at this concept of for yourself moving more to helping other entrepreneurs grow you have your own growing family yeah you know, teenagers which means i don't sleep anymore but um I always thought that it was just the babies that you don't sleep. And now all of a sudden it's like teenagers again. Yeah. 
you didn't anticipate a uh, TikTok and Instagram. TikTok, and then also and the, the, uh, the chaos of, uh, they cause. Seven a.m. school days starting for high school students. <laughs> I'm like, what is this with the South in those early super mornings? All right, but back to the kind of the point. You've had a lot of success. You've had success. How are you going about defining what that's going to mean, and especially as you move forward? What does success mean for you personally as an entrepreneur? Not for Spiffy, not for the companies you help, but like, how are you looking to define that success for you? Yeah, I get the most satisfaction out of building things. You know, so so having an idea, and I try to do things that haven't been done before, so that's more fun. You know, so building, you know, copying something, you, you could do that, and it's a viable business strategy. It's not for me. I want to do something that no one's tried before. I don't want to be like the fifth VC fund. I want to try a different thing. I don't want to build the one millionth car wash. Let's try a different approach. So building something that's unique that no one's ever done before is where I get the most satisfaction. And then inside of there is wrapped a lot of stuff, building the team, solving the problems, making it through all the externalities like bank crises and pandemics and all this stuff and getting through to the other side that, and then you can point at that and say, you know, we built that. We had this idea and we built it from nothing. That's what I get the most satisfaction out of. And the team building of that and getting everyone aligned and, and doing it and then helping it's infectious. Cause like once you're in it and doing it, you realize it's a pretty special experience that, that, you know, kind of once in a lifetime kind of thing to go you and that team together solving that problem is, is pretty special. So that that's what I get a lot of joy from. Very cool, I'm sure yeah. you've felt that as well. Yeah. Regardless I mean, of if it's a, and you feel it, you feel it if it's a million dollar thing, uh, if you, it's, if it's a retail store, that's the fun of entrepreneurship is that you can get that feeling and it's just as good at any scale. I'm in a position where I can go for pretty big, you know, moonshot type stuff, but you don't have to do it that way. It's, you know, Whatever it is you're doing, that's the fun part of our friendship. I definitely agree. I think it's a combination of seeing where the people who have worked with you and for you, seeing where they go on, which is funny, you know, now all of a sudden having like nearly 30 years being like, wow, people have had an entire career. How did this happen? I remember that guy couldn't even, like, we had to remind him to bathe on a regular basis. He's now a VP at whatever. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. like seeing yeah. that growth of people. You had an so influence on that. Yeah, well, hopefully you were, you were a part of that. That's uh, important. Yeah. And then I think as you're talking about those, those X factor moments, like things that in a million years, you wouldn't know, like a bank run on one of the, you know, default players, you know, in the space and how you were able to help move that. Yeah. For me, the threading of needles of things you just never would have planned as a risk factor and being able to get your business. But yeah, I agree. Those are, those are pretty, those are the things that kind of glow in the hindsight. So that's pretty cool. So Scott, thank you for sharing that. I mean, how can the audience learn more about what you're doing, learn more about Spiffy? Yes, our website is uh, GetSpiffy, G-E-T-S-P-I-F-F-Y. We're in all the app stores, so download the app. And, and uh, we're not everywhere. We're only in about uh, 30 markets in the United States, 60 if you include franchising. But we have pretty good coverage of the major metros. And then I do pontificate about entrepreneurship. LinkedIn is a good place to follow me. It's Scott with one T, S-C-O-T, and then last name Wingo, W-I-N-G-O. Uh, and I'm also on Twitter as Scott Wingo, just Scott Wingo altogether. So would love to have a follow and, and uh, I love talking about entrepreneurship. So feel free to reach out to me. And uh, if this stimulated any ideas or you want to keep the conversation going, reach out. Cool. Everyone will make sure those are in the show notes, those links, and we will make sure um, in the newsletter when this episode comes out and um, in the, uh, our socials. Scott, thank you so much for coming on. I go Cox. That's all I can kind of say here as yeah. we end this up. Yeah. Wow. Thank you. Yeah. Maybe we'll run each other in uh, Columbia at some point. Maybe one of your teenagers will go to South Carolina and we'll, we'll see you down there. Definitely. It's or come just, to a North Carolina school. Yeah. So <laughs> let me know. I'm trying to push them more to the North Carolinas, but yeah. I mean, but a pint down in uh, at Five Points would be very good. I haven't been to group therapy in 20 plus years. I missed that bar. That was a great bar. It was. All right. All right. We'll do a reunion. Hit me up. All right, I will. Definitely. All right, everyone. Thank you again for listening. Remember, go check out beyond8figures.com and sign up for the newsletter so you can be the first one to know when Scott and other cool entrepreneurs like him come on the show. All right, everyone. Talk to you soon. Goodbye. Thanks, AJ. Bye-bye, Scott.